All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Brian Bradley, who is in lovely Portland, Oregon. How are you doing, Brad? Brian? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for having me on. It's going to be a lot of fun and, you know, we've got a lot of important things to quickly go over on the road of asset protection and maybe, you know, busting some myths about, you know, what people, you know, what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Brian's a asset protection attorney, financial planner, and number one best-selling author of the book Overexposed. Uh, and in his spare time, as you can see from behind it, he likes to throw people on the ground and uh, and choke them out <laughs> as an <laughs> average a, a jiu jitsu practitioner. Uh, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about today is asset protection strategy. So um, let's let's talk, uh, Brian, maybe bottom line this for people. What are some of the mistakes people make with their assets that uh, and not protecting them properly? I mean, what are some of the mistakes that people just make out of maybe pure just ignorance? Yeah, I, I, mean, saying, I mean that in just, you know, that people yeah. don't know because they don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Like what I get a lot is just like the timing of it, mm -hmm. right? They think that this is something I can just wait on until after I get sued. You know, like it's, it's common nature. We don't want to think about bad things happening until they already happen. Like it's one of the reasons why we kick the can, the can down the road on creating an estate plan, right? And right. the next thing you know, grandpa or mom dies and like, hey, where's the will? Where's the trust? Oh, they didn't do anything. And then all, you know, hell breaks loose. Same thing happens in the world of asset protection. People call in saying, hey, I just got sued for X, Y, Z problem. What can you do for me now? And unfortunately, at that point in time, it's too late. We're too far down the rabbit hole. You know, the asset protection systems like LLCs or asset protection trusts and all of that have to be set up beforehand for them even to work. And so it's kind of like going and getting, you know, car insurance after an accident or, you know, fire insurance insurance after your house caught on fire and say, hey, cover it. Uh -uh, sorry, like that's not going to happen. Same thing in the world of asset protection. For it to even work, we have to set this stuff up before you're being sued. You know, another big misconception about asset protection is just what it is and what it's not. Mm. And so asset protection is simply creating like a, a legal barrier between your assets and a potential creditor, like the person suing you before you need it right before you're being sued so it's like a safe that we're going to put our gold and our guns in our valuables in you know so anything of value we want to take out of our name and put it behind this legal barrier and out of your personal name so that it's not easily attached with the lien but i get a lot of calls saying hey brian i want to create asset protection because i don't want to pay taxes right, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not asset protection like that's illegal, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, if you have a program that does that or whatever, let me know. <laughs> like, exactly. Like I'd be everybody's best friend in the world, sure. but I'm not going to go to jail for you and and hiding money or moving assets to not pay or avoid paying taxes is illegal, right? You're yeah. taxed on your worldwide income, especially if you're a U.S. resident, yeah. and so it's not estate planning and. Um, you know, like, I don't care if you, I use this analogy, like you're Elon Musk and you're, you know, mining, you know, in asteroid in space and you make a trillion dollars out in space on your like, you know, <laughs> asteroid space mining program, you're still going to be taxed on your income there. So it has to be set up beforehand and it's not to hide or avoid paying taxes. Mm -hmm. Those are like the really two big ones mm -hmm. besides like breaking down misconceptions of LLCs. Yeah. Well, yeah. And let's talk a little about that because, uh, you know, a lot of people perceive, uh, assume, you know, if I, if I set up an LLC that protects all my assets, right? You know, it's uh, all my assets outside the business, say. Yeah, correct. And so, like, I like LLCs, don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. they're the base level, entry level 101 asset protection layer. Like, that's right above you doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> and and there's been this misconception like in the last two or three years that just go create an LLC and, you know, it's the, it's the dragon slayer. You're perfectly fine and there's nothing more that that you need to do. And this mm -hmm. is completely false. They miss first word, first letter. Like they tell you straight up in the name, limited. Like they limited. Don't, Yeah, they don't hide this fact from you. And so people need to realize like LLCs were set up in the 70s with the goal of blending the elements of, you know, corporations and partnerships 
without the downside of double taxation. So mm -hmm. asset protection was never the end goal of LLCs. And so by nature, they're just not the strongest entity. And it really gets just down to, you know, like, what are we trying to protect? And this is where the people start getting this idea of like jurisdiction shopping, right? Like I'm a California resident. I'm going to go use a Wyoming LLC to put my California real estate in it. And they don't realize there's no legal connection or nexus, like big fancy legal word mm -hmm. to that state. And there's a Supreme Court case on this. It's um, Mallory versus Norfolk. And this the Supreme Court upheld a Pennsylvania statute that forces companies to face litigation within the borders that is registered to do business in. So if you're a, like a Cal, I love picking on California. So I'm just yeah, oh, you yeah. well because yeah. we have we we love regulation. <laughs> no, you do. And then I was a trial lawyer in California oh, for okay. so long. So I I I just can't help it. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're a California resident and you own like a California piece of real estate, and then you create this Wyoming LLC, well, the Supreme Court just literally said, you know, you're going to be able to face litigation within the borders that that LLC. So that out-of-state Wyoming LLC is registered to do business in. Mm -hmm. And so we're confusing the difference between like business law and tort and personal injury right. law. If you and I, right, you know, like John and I wanted to go create a company to go sell widgets nationally. Yeah, we mm -hmm. can use Wyoming or Delaware, Nevada, right? Yep. Because yeah. it's going to control the internal affairs and disputes of our business if we start falling apart. But if we're holding like assets and real estate in it, that's not a business. It's a holding company. And when someone's getting hurt on your like rental properties or your investments, and then they're suing you for like personal injury and tort damages liability, that's not an internal dispute. That's not a business dispute. That's a you know personal injury lawsuit. Those are state specific. So we got to be very cautious of where we're setting these LLCs up in. And just because you hear some you know CPA or some you know, salesman promoter at some investment conference talking about, hey, just go use Wyoming and Delaware. And they're like pumping and turning the mill to, to close you to create, you know, these LLCs. You got to think about, you know, the legal side of it and how it's going to work when you actually need it to work. Yeah. So essentially then, I mean, what you're saying is uh, that the LLC, as you said, if we wanted to sell widgets, it's all, it's a good, it's a good mechanism for that. However, if you're looking to you know put other assets or whatever, and as you said, more of a holding company, then it's not the greatest. What what is a better what are what are better strategies if you want to protect your assets? Yeah, that's a great thing. So I talk about it in the realm of layers, right? Like we are going to start with LLCs, and we yep. will use an LLC, and this is it in the state the assets at. So if it's your California property, it's California, Tennessee, Tennessee. And then what we do is we start adding different layers as you grow. So if you're just starting out like one or two properties or like, you're, you know, you're just creating a business now, we're just starting out at the base level, like LLC and insurance, right? And so think about the layers like winter, like we're going to go on a ski trip, all right? Like I originally grew up in Lake Tahoe. It's yeah. really cold. I live in Oregon, right? Cold, wet, you know, rainy, damp here. We, we dress in layers. Layers are our friends. Same thing with asset protection. And so, like I said, that first entry layer is your base layer. So it's going to be like that thin shirt that sits on your skin. That's an LLC and in insurance, right? We're just starting out. We have no units or like no assets or maybe like a couple rental properties. Our net worth is below 250000 below. That's where we're at with the entry level. Then we're starting to grow, right? We're adding more assets or we're, you know, having more um, profile Net worth is probably generally around five hundred to seven hundred thousand, you know, of net exposed assets. That's where a mid layer comes into play, right? Like a sweatshirt or a cardigan for you ladies. Right. Um, that is going to be a management company. Some people might use a Wyoming LLC. We prefer using limited partnerships because they're just the next level up from LLCs because of the way we can structure them and do more with them. But that's where we're going to start adding that next layer, that limited partnership management company layer. And then you're going to keep growing, right? Hopefully we're expanding. One day we're going to hit that million dollar exposed net worth mark. Um, that's where we get that third layer, the final layer. That's that outer shell waterproof jacket that we put on in a really bad winter storm, right? This is going to keep you nice and dry and warm when the weather's really bad. That's a doomsday level protection. This is called an asset protection trust. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how we layer these out. It just comes down to a combination of, where are we at? What's the risk? Where we're going? And then what layers do we need to go there? So what does the uh, the limited partnership, what what additional protections does that give you over the LLC? 
Yeah. So one of the main, two main ones here, one, it cleans you up from a tax perspective, because as we start adding and you start growing more assets, we can incorporate all, we can 10, a hundred LLCs underneath it, have them all disregarded and flow up and into that limited partnership, let you have one tax filing instead of 10, 20, 50, okay. right? You're, if you didn't have that, you would be your CPA's best friend. They'd be taking you out to dinner every night. We just <laughs> want to simplify your tax life. One tax filing, a K-1 issued to you. That's it. The other benefit of it that you just cannot do with any type of LLC is just the nature of how limited partnerships are designed. And so limited partnerships by statute have to split up management from owners. So I talk mm -hmm. about it like a split personality. You have like the left side of the brain, which is the general partner, the managing member. The right, right side of the brain is the owner of it. You want to be the managing member of it and then have eventually your asset protection trust as the owner. But limited partnerships by statute, that's the only way they can be created by splitting up managers from owners. You just can't do this with an LLC unless you get really, really creative with the operating agreements. And the problem with that is they open up the door for fraud because they're not designed to be created that way. So when you get sued and I present the you know operating agreement to the judge, generally they're going to throw them out and pierce the veil. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the key point, isn't it? The uh, understanding how strong that veil is at each level, right? Because, I mean, that's where people often erroneously assume that that veil is like bulletproof, but it's not. Well, it, it's, it's, it's really not. And um, it, it's I, I think I explain it like that thin, flimsy piece of fabric that sits over the face of a bride on her wedding day. Right. <laughs> like it's there. It's thin. It's there for a little bit of protection. But it's not a dragon slayer at mm. all. Um, and then the California Court of Appeals had a case, you know, back in the 60s that laid out about 20 different methods for piercing the corporate veil. I mean, just a few of them are like commingling of funds, right. not having proper um, formalities, like maintaining the formalities, not having like operating agreements. And so like there's a whole list of them and that's not an exclusive list. So it's very mm. easy to pierce the veil if we really want to. Yeah. And then, uh, okay, then tell us about the the hybrid uh, the hybrid trust. Yeah, so we get in the world of trust. This is where there's a lot of misconceptions that come mm -hmm. in, into asset protection. A lot of people think like, oh well, I have a trust, I'm protected, and they they they're misconstruing their estate plan or the revocable living trust as an also you know an asset protection trust, which they they, they completely are not. And so, you know, the standard 101 trust that everybody, again, is familiar with started in the 60s. This is your estate plan, you know, the revocable living trust. Mm -hmm. You might have one, your mom might have one, grandparents might have one. They're about transferring assets once you pass and die and avoiding probate in the courts, all right? Then the next type of trust, we have like land trust if you're investing in real estate. Right. They hold land that you connect to the LLC but they don't have any protection in and of themselves. They're just a privacy mechanism. Um, they're not a protection mechanism. Um, then you have sort of like Delaware and Wyoming statutory trust. These are more tax mitigation strategies to avoid um, paying like franchise tax in California, but they're not asset protection strategies. Then we get into asset protection trust. And these are just completely different types of trust. Just think about it like ice cream, right? We have you know lots of different flavors and types of ice cream. Same thing in the world of trust, right? So we got some that pass on assets, some that help us with tax strategies, and then some that protect our assets. And these have self-settled spendthrift legislation. And that's kind of the teeth in them um, that, that protect our assets. And when we're talking about the world of asset protection trust, we can create them like offshore in the Cook Islands, here domestically. The hybrid trust takes the strength of the offshore ones, like the statutory non-recognition, combines it with the ease of tax simplicity of the domestic. And then you take the best of both of them and combine them for a stronger, better, more flexible trust. And those are hybrid trusts, which we call a bridge trust. Mm -hmm. And the reason we do that is because most people don't need a fully foreign Cook Island trust. It's just way overkill. It's the right. strongest, most effective trust in the world, but it comes with a lot of IRS requirements. They're very expensive. So while they're very effective, it's for most people, like 99.9% .9 of society is way overkill. Mm -hmm. The problem with the domestic is though they're cheaper, 
and you don't have all the IRS tax, you know, mandatory requirements, they're just not very effective. Starting the 2000s, they've just been completely pierced and destroyed. Mm -hmm. But if you take the strong points of both of them and combine them, you actually have a very functional and effective working asset protection trust. So if somebody was listening and they were thinking, does this sound like something that's good for me? What what, what does the, what uh, what kind of profile of, of person business is the hybrid trust uh, best for? <laughs> Yeah, the hybrid trust is that outer shell waterproof layer, right? Mm -hmm. So that's when you know, say like you have a high risk profession, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, CPA, you're a real estate investor, um, or maybe like some of my favorite clients, you're a nurse or a firefighter cop who self funded your retirement and investment properties. Mm -hmm. And you got to keep those safe because if one lawsuit, you're not going to retire ever again. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's the profile generally like 1 million of net exposed assets and some sort of risk to warrant an asset protection trust or specifically a hybrid trust. Um, if it's below that mark, it just comes into like which layer, if you're just starting out LLCs, or maybe we go management company LLCs and just sort of scale as you go. Right. And and uh, and so it, what's the what's the first steps if somebody was going to do something that obviously work with somebody like you, but how complex is this to set up? Yeah, they're actually really simple to set up. I would say generally like for the whole, Taj Mahal, Cadillac, you know, system. It's about 30 to 40 days to set up and transfer all the assets over. Um, uh, you should get like a, anyone that you're talking to, I hopefully you're talking to an attorney, not just like mm -hmm. a salesman. Um, and then ask them like, oh, is this your legal advice? Like if you're talking to like some salesman, like, no, I want to talk to an attorney because mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to jeopardize all of your assets and air quotes, legal advice. If you're talking to a salesman, you know, get some decent legal advice there and they should do a full risk profile. What's your job? Do you have kids? You know, what assets do you own? How are things titled? What kind of clientele do you work with? Are they just pushing and peddling one option or are they actually presenting like a different array of right. um, options and then rep recommending and pros and cons of each and letting you decide for yourself? Mm -hmm. One of the worst things I hate is just people force shoving something down somebody's throat. And um, that's not a real, especially if it's a lawyer, you know, law yeah. firm, they just be giving you a legal recommendation and then letting you decide for yourself. Um, so those are things I would look at. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and then uh, so if if you're if you're going to do something like this, uh, you have to obviously get your house in order first too, right? I mean, you need to have every, you need to have all your uh, you know I's dotted and t's crossed, and have everything within your business or whatever it is you're trying to protect. Make sure all that is is there and proper. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so if you're a business owner, same thing. And like for myself, you know. Um, I, I don't invest in real estate, but I, I in, invest through insurance, you know, is the way I mm -hmm. like to do it, like IULs and, you know, things like that. But, you know, exposed assets and, you know, real estate and things like that, like I would absolutely have this, this um, system and set up as well. Yeah. What do you see? Because obviously, the, as you said, I mean, these laws and these uh, regulations, you know, they evolve and change over time. Uh, are there any other changes on the horizon that you see that uh, people should take notice of? No, I see what I'm seeing more and more is each state starting to see that our legal system is just a complete mess. <laughs> and so you're seeing more and more states jumping on board of creating their own as you know, um, asset protection legislation and regulation. So now we got about 19 states that have some level of self-settled spendthrift legislation. And I just see more and more states coming on and board, especially as sort of the, you know, West Coast and East Coast states go crazier and people are leaving and trying to find out where to invest. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the other states that are known for protecting assets, increasing their protections because they're all trying to compete, right, and make money. And then you're seeing other states notice this as well and coming on board. So I see kind of like these two polar splits, some states just going more radical and other states trying to pick up the business from that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I mean, as you know, in this state in California, I mean, the legal system is off the charts. It's, and, yeah. it's a and, racket here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I just uh, I, I helped somebody recently with an issue that they had, and it's just one of those ones where y you just lose because the the law is so warped and so to one side, and you can it's always going to cost you more to to challenge than it is well, to. Yeah, because our system's not set up on justice; it's set yeah. up on easily suing somebody and collecting money, and it turned into a predatory system since the, about the early '60s. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, listen, Brian, this has been fascinating. Great, great information. And just to remind people again, the book is called uh, 
Whereas overexposed. overexposed, overexposed, I would highly recommend you go check it out, particularly uh, if you have assets that you're looking to protect. Uh, all of Brian's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, so like as we mentioned before, like I'm an asset protection attorney, um, especially for like the high risk, high net worth, and I also have a financial business um, planning company as well because they kind of go hand in hand together and you can jump on my website www.btblegal.com i use it more as an educational resource for people to just go in and check out case law watch educational videos because i find there's a, there's a lack of good resources yeah. and education and content on this and that was the whole purpose of the book i had so many clients calling in and saying man like we don't have any overall horn book on this crazy maze. We just hear someone peddling one thing or another. And so when I researched it, I realized there was no book. So I just decided to write the book myself. Yeah, fantastic. And that book, the link to that book will be below. As I said, I encourage you to check it out. So listen, thanks again, Brian. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, John.